You're listening to Experience Imagination, a themed entertainment design podcast presented by Falcons Creative Group. Every episode, we discuss a new topic with a panel of creative professionals. Hi, I'm Cecil McPurry, President and Chief Creative Officer of Falcons. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome back to Experience Imagination. This is Abhinav Narayan, the moderator for the episode. We are starting part one of a two-part series talking about the art of animation and its role in storytelling and in modern entertainment. We had the good fortune to be able to bring in Aaron Blaze for this first episode, a veteran in the field of animation. I'm joined right now by our producer, Jason Ambler, who knows Aaron to talk a little bit more about what we can expect from our conversation with him. Happy to be here. Thanks, Abhinav. You know, Aaron, uh, I've known for um, over a decade now, going back to our days at Digital Domain, where we worked and hung out together. Yeah. Amazing, amazing, brilliant light. Had an incredible career uh, starting out at Disney, animating everything from Beast to Nala in the Lion, King, Lion yeah. King to, you know, working on Aladdin, Mulan, j- just about every, you know, animated film of the 90s that a lot of people had grown up watching, um, Aaron had a part of and was able to uh, direct a feature film for Disney called Brother Bear yeah. through his website, creatureartteacher.com sells everything from Photoshop brushes, does tutorials. He's got a huge following. He does a lot of speaking engagements for uh, Adobe to Wacom, really trying to spread the gospel of art and animation to the world. Well, let's go ahead and jump into our interview with Aaron Blaze, and then we'll regroup with Jason at the end. Aaron, how's it going? Hey, everybody. My name is Aaron Blaze, and I'm an animator, designer, director. I had 21 years at the Walt Disney Feature Animation Company, and I'm currently independent of filmmaking and teaching animation and different types of art around the world. Awesome. Thank you so much, Aaron. Thanks again for for joining us. We're really excited to speak with you today. Very happy to be here. The first question that I have for you is um, we'd love to know more about your personal journey as, as an artist and as an animator. What first attracted you to the craft of animation? How'd you get your start? It's funny. I needed a job. It was, <laughs> I wasn't one of these guys that grew up, you know, wanting to be an animator, <laughs> having dreams of wanting to work for Disney. I grew up wanting to be an artist. I grew up in South Florida, out in the swamps in a little trailer. And, um, and I chased animals and, and photographed them and drew them. And I was a creepy kid because I like to pick up roadkill and draw that because I wanted to understand the anatomy of animals and how they worked. And, um, and it was just, I was always into natural history. And so as I grew and my art developed, I wanted to be an illustrator for National Geographic. That was my big dream. Uh, and also an animal painter. And so, you know, through my teens and into my high school years, that's what I focused on until ultimately when I was 18, I, I headed off to the Ringling College of uh, Art and Design in Sarasota, Florida to get uh, an illustration degree uh, with the goal of working for National Geographic Magazine. Um, I didn't have a lot of money, so I freelanced as much as I could in order to pay my tuition and pay the bills. And so um, I really was hoping and, and depending upon a staff position. I didn't want to freelance anymore and I just wanted a nice secure job. And so I found out really quickly that National Geographic only freelanced the type of work that I wanted to do. They didn't have staff positions. And so I had to kind of reevaluate and rethink my career choice. And uh, and so as I was doing that, I found out this is and this is right about my second year in college. I found out that there was two companies coming to interview at at school. Uh, One was Hallmark Cards, the greeting card company, and the other one was Walt Disney. And lucky for me, Disney was first because I was going to interview with both. And I was interested in Disney maybe doing background painting or, or something. I didn't really know. I didn't know anything about animation, so I didn't really know how I would fit in. And uh, But what they wanted to do was just see a portfolio of animal drawings and figure drawings because uh, it was the first time that they had looked outside of animation schools. They, At the time, there, really, you know, there wasn't really a market for animation. It wasn't the big boom yet. This is in 1987, 1988. But they were beginning to want to ramp up because they knew it was going to happen. 
This is all right before uh, Oliver and Company back in the late '80s, and so they had kind of tapped out in schools right. in North America, uh, Cal Arts and Sheridan in Canada, and so they wanted to see if they could get students that could draw well uh, from other schools and then bring them in and teach them animation, and so that's where I came in. So they came to the school, they liked my portfolio, they brought me in, and lucky for me, I was. I was matched up with an amazing animator to be my mentor. His name is Glenn Keane, and uh, he's one of the greatest contemporary animators that are out there right now. Uh, he was the creator of The Mermaid. He was the creator of, of Beast from Beauty and the Beast. He created Tarzan. He created all these really incredibly memorable characters through the 90s. And, and it was sitting with him. I remember my first wow. day that I started my internship, and within about... I don't know, 10 minutes of talking with him about the art of animation, him telling me, um, I was inspired and I realized that's what I wanted to do for the rest of my life. And I trained over that six weeks, uh, got hired, and here I am 33 years later doing it. You know, I think over over the course of that process, the the field of animation seems to have gone through a lot of expansion and evolution. Many different artists, including yourself, continually challenging what is possible from the medium. I'd love to hear your thoughts on on how you think animation has evolved, or even how it's stayed the same over that period of time. Yeah, well, you just said it right in the question. It has it has evolved, or at least morphed. To me, evolving seems to be something that, you know, right. improves upon itself. And I think what's happened is, I don't know that the art of animation has evolved because it's still just strong storytelling, right? It's storytelling, it's great characters, great worlds that take you on a journey that make your heart race, that make you want to cry, that make you want to laugh. Those are the great films that supply that. And so whether it's, you know, Beauty and the Beast from almost 30 years ago, to a contemporary film that, uh, that Pixar might do now, the storytelling I don't think has really evolved as much as just the way we make them. And to me, that's just a morphing. It's natural. I mean, it, as artists, we're always trying to find new ways of expressing ourselves. And so many people, you know, because I started out as a 2D animator and I still am a 2D animator. I love to sit down and I just love to draw every frame. And so many people have come up and asked me and said, you know, aren't you angry or don't you feel uh, upset that this art has kind of gone away and has been replaced by these computer animated films? And I don't. I completely understand the process that our minds take. I mean, we, we're always looking for different ways to express ourselves. And I think that the computer and technology really came in at a time when it needed to in the, in the mid-90s. And uh, But it's interesting now because just like everything else and things change and evolve and kind of morph. CG has had its stay in the limelight over the last 20 years, and it's cemented. So that's never going to go away. But now, with the advent of new ways of content distribution through streaming and you know a lot of other avenues, we're seeing a kind of a new renaissance in animation, and 2D is making a comeback again alongside 3D. So now they're you know it doesn't matter which one is which they're they're getting equal time in the sun, so to speak. And so, you know, whether it's Netflix that's really expanding or or some of these other studios, I think we're going to see an, a big increase in 2D animated films kind of going back to, except for the technology that we were, you know, where we were 20 or 30 years ago, which is sitting down and drawing out your stories, which I think is is pretty cool. Absolutely. Yeah. And I, I think it makes total sense that the, the technology might change, but the destination is always the same. So even no matter what it morphs into, it's always about, like you said, the, the storytelling, the, the emotion at, at its core. I think that's great. One of the things that I wanted to ask you about is moving from talking about how animation morphs through medium or technology. I'd love to get your thoughts on, on how animation may morph when dealing with different types of characters, different subject matter. H how does the process change or stay the same when you're animating a dinosaur versus animating a superhero versus animating, say, a, a grizzly bear or, or something like that? Yeah, well, once again, it still comes down to character. You know, one of the things I tell students is that animation is not the art of moving something. So it's not the art of whether or not I can move a grizzly bear well 
or whether or not I can move a superhero well or if I can move a dinosaur well. It's really the art of bringing them to life. And so when you're bringing something to life, you're bringing personality, you're bringing a history to those characters that we can we can relate to. It's, it's like music, for instance. It's not how fast you can play all the notes. It's it's the notes you choose. And, and the notes you choose will give it personality yeah. and it'll give it shape. And, it'll, and sometimes it's the notes you don't play that give it the most personality. And it's the same thing with animation. And so when I sit down, um, it doesn't matter what the medium is to me, although there are aspects, you know, just, you know, how, how I might model or rig a character in 3D as opposed to just drawing it in 2D. But when it comes to actually bringing that character to life, you know, I have conversations with the animators more along the lines of, you know, who is this character and what are they thinking? You know, when we when we animate, we don't animate what a character is doing. We animate what they're thinking. And that's how you get the emotion across. And um, and there's always some kind of, you know, in, in storytelling, there's always a conflict. There's always a, a hurdle, whether it's through the course of the movie, the course of a sequence or the course of a shot. There's there's a hurdle that a character emotionally has to get through within that journey whether like i said whether it's a shot which might be 10 seconds or it might be the course of the of a movie and so it's understanding how that character is going to handle that situation in its own unique personal way yeah. that's going to give that character personality and make you want to get behind that character and root for it yes. or want them to die <laughs> or whatever it might be it's those choices that you make as the animator in bringing them to life. And if you've done it well, you're going to have characters that are Simba or the beast or bell. You know, I can name these, these, these characters. And as soon as I say these names, Iconic, yeah. everybody knows who they are and they know their personalities and they know how they act because those animators that created yeah. them put themselves into them and brought them to life in that way. And I think that's whether it's CG, whether it's VR no matter what it is, it doesn't matter how advanced we get, it's still going to come back to the way we approach those characters and bring them to life and giving them a personality that we can all relate to, whether you're from here or Vietnam or Kenya or wherever. There's emotions that are universal the world right, over, yeah. and those are the emotions that we try to tap into. You know, um, before we uh, started recording on this uh our producer Jason was uh, telling us that there was a time in your career at one point where you were working in a studio that was inside or or next to a theme park, uh, theme park setting where where there were actually guests going through. Could you talk a little bit about that and what that was like? Sure. Um, you know, my first job was working with Disney, so um, you know, I did that internship uh, that I was talking about earlier on. And I did that at the end of my second year at Ringling. Uh, at the time, Ringling was just a three-year school. And so uh, the summer between my second and third year, I went and did this internship. I spent six weeks learning animation. And at the end of it, I was hired. And it turned out that they were building this new animation studio in Orlando uh, right within the theme parks. Uh, and it was at MGM Studios. I think it became Hollywood Studios after that or something like that. But it was, uh, it, at the time, it was called MGM Studios. And it was right there with Epcot and, and Magic Kingdom and all that. And uh, they built an animation studio, a real working animation studio. But the idea was they wanted guests to be able to come through and see the way we make our films. And we were going to make real films and people could watch. Right. Well, they obviously couldn't have tourists walking through the studio. so. The way they designed it was the studio was ground level and then about five feet above along the walls behind glass, people could come in and watch us draw. We started working on this Roger Rabbit cartoon, a short cartoon that uh, six minutes that went out with the movie Dick Tracy. And so when the studio finally opened on May 1st, um, we were working away on this project and uh, we always called it the fishbowl and we were the fish. Because people would come through and we had we had about 10,000 people a day that would come through and watch us work. So you had to, you had to watch out where you scratched and <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, because there was always, you know, someone looking over your shoulder. And um, and it was funny. Sometimes you get 
people being loud or or kicking the walls. You, you know, every once in a while, I'd get a little kid who would bang his head against the wall, and we all kept little uh, like suction cup dart guns and all kinds of stuff at our desks, and we'd play with the crowds in that way. And I'd shoot little kids in the head and <laughs> all kinds of stuff. But it was fun. It was it was pretty crazy. We always said, you know, when it was time for a break, we'd go around, and go park walk, park walk, park walk. All right, let's go park walk. And so we'd all get up from our desk and we'd head out. Um, when we did, we usually took our name tags off. We had, you know, the Disney badges. And sometimes people would recognize us if they had seen us in the, in the, in the, you know, in the studio earlier in the day. But most times, people didn't recognize us. And so, you know, the great thing about MGM is that they had a couple of little bars here and there hidden away where you could grab a beer and and we'd grab a beer and hang out and take a little bit of a break. Then we go back to work or we go out and, you know, play football. And some of the guys that I worked with, you know, this was their dream job to be able to to work at Disney. They'd been Disney fans their whole lives and they were working on a Disney movie. And then they get to go out on a park walk and they take rides and on their break. And then they come back in and work on a movie again. And they were just they were like the dwarves and Snow White. And it was just they were just so happy to be there. Um, so my uh, my next question is. What you think has been the most challenging kind of element to animate in your career so far? At different times of my career, you know, challenges become different. And it's funny, every film that I've worked on had its own unique challenges. It sounds like a canned answer, but it really is the truth. Um, and as I've grown, then, then something new and unique on the next film presents itself. But probably the most difficult but rewarding animation experience I had was during Beauty and the Beast because I I was a a young animator and I was one of the animators of the Beast himself. Wow. So he was such a complex character, both visually and emotionally. And I really tried hard to immerse myself in that character. And he was being led by the, by Glenn Keane, who mentored me, you know, two or three years earlier. And so I had really grown or built a respect for him. He had given me this opportunity and I didn't want to let him down and I wanted to do the best I could. And uh, and so he was the supervising animator. For those of you that don't know how this works, in the animated film, you have a character like the Beast who has a, a huge amount of screen time. And so no one animator can animate all of the Beast and Beauty and the Beast. So there's a team of animators. Glenn Keane was the lead and it's his job to be basically quality control uh, and then there was a uh, uh, five more of us after that. So there were six people all together that animated the beast. And one of the guys, uh, and, and you got to remember too, that we were two, two studios. The main studio for making beating the beast was in California in Glendale, California. And then we were a satellite studio in Florida helping to make the film. And so one of the main animators of bell was uh, a guy named Mark Hen, and he worked at our studio in Orlando. And so they needed somebody to animate the beast against him. They needed a Florida beast guy is what they said. And so Glenn asked me to be that Florida beast guy. (laughs) And so I think I was 22 or 23 at the time and I'm animating the beast. I'm a brand new animator. And, um, but one of the great things about Glenn Keane is just how incredibly generous and such a great teacher he is. And he gave me the sequence where bell is trying to bandage the beast in front of the fireplace and they get into this big argument back and forth while she's trying to bandage him. And the sequence isn't very long. It's only about a minute, minute and a half. But it's an incredible amount of acting. It's incredibly juicy animation work that any animator would give their left arm to, to have. And he yeah. gave it to me. And I remember I just I, yeah, I dove sure. into it. And it was up to that point, it was the most difficult sequence I had ever done. I, I spent almost a month just planning it and working out the choreography and then I spent another three months or so animating it. And so it took a lot of work, uh, but it became a highlight in the film. And uh, and it really launched my career after that. So that was probably my my most difficult and fondest memory. That's amazing. I, you know, to your, to your point before, you talked about how so many of these characters are just so iconic. I'm sure many of our listeners are remembering exactly the scene that you're talking about and, and, and know the, the movements and the emotions that those characters 
you know, demonstrated. I, I think that there are just so many amazing projects that you have that you have touched in your career so far. The question that comes to my mind is, what is a dream project to you? What what attracts you most to a story or a, an animation project? Big emotional coming of age stories. That's what really draw me. You know, I directed Brother Bear, which you know, I, I, I like the film and it, it was it was my first film. There's a lot that I would change about it, but I think it was a good first effort. And that film is really kind of a, a good representation of the type of story I like to tell. Big and epic and emotional and coming of age. And, and you know, our, the Absolutely. main guy is somebody that needs something to learn. He's got to go through this emotional journey. Um, and I think that I've, I've had a couple of films along the way that I didn't get to finish that I would love to go back. Jason knows very well about this the film that we were making when we were at Digital Domain together, The Legend of Tembo, which was a huge coming of age story about an elephant during the time of Alexander and Hannibal when they used elephants in battle. Oh, wow. And how he loses himself along the way. And it's him trying to having to find himself again and make his way back home to become basically an elephant of the savannah again. And um, it was a big epic story. And, you know, it's those types of things that that I love. I love to tell. Um, they're, they On the outside, they sound big and serious, but I love to inject the fun. I love the music. I love everything that goes into making these films. That's, that's what has me hooked. I haven't had the opportunity to do anything like that since. And I've been offered, oh, about nine movies, I guess, over the last five years to direct. But none of them have been on a par that makes me want to leave what I'm doing now and go direct another movie. You know, I've got dream movies out there, but I don't know if I'll ever get to it. (laughs) At this point, I I think the only other question that I would have for you, Aaron, is what advice would you have for people who are interested in getting into animation? You know, I get that question all the time. Well, the thing about animation is you have to, you have to love it. If you don't love it, it's just going to chew you up and spit you (laughs) out like any other job, I think, really. But the other thing, too, about young artists getting into animation is that so many of them, this is where I sound like the old man. So many of them come from what I call the um, uh, American Idol. There you go. It's the American Idol generation where everything happens so quickly. (laughs) And then and these are this is a generation that grew up with the internet that grew up with instant access to information. They have phones where they can instantly get what they need. That attitude that I've seen, and it's not, it's not anyone's fault. It's just, that's, that's the world we live in. Um, But what's interesting about that is that that expectation of instant uh, gratification, instant access carries over to, I want instant success in, in whatever it is that I'm doing. And that's why I call it the American Idol generation, because you you get used to seeing people, you know, go on a show and, you know, within an audition, all of a sudden they're big stars. And I can't tell you how many times you watch that show and there's a kid sitting there 18 years old going, hey, man, I don't know if I'm what I'm going to do if I don't make it this time. And you just go, what? (laughs) Come on. And and the thing about animation is that it's there's nothing quick about it. You know, there's nothing quick about it's development and how you develop as an artist. And so right. I get so many yeah. young artists that are, you know, they're just finishing their first year of training in animation. And their first question to me is, how do I become a director? And, you know, it's, it's, it's a slow growth process. And, and it's something that you have to master. You have to do those 10,000 bad drawings. You've got to do, you know, you've got to put in the time and it, and it's, it's like trimming a bonsai tree. You know, it just, it takes time and patience and years to create the storytelling in the way that you want to do it. So that's my, my biggest piece of advice is just, you know, patience and let the process be the process, which is just grow, you know, love what you do, do it every day, Take the opportunities that present themselves and do the best you can. And over the course of that, you will grow as an artist. And eventually, you know, that that growth will lead to bigger opportunities, which will lead to bigger opportunities. And, and you know, if you can keep that mindset and don't chase the dollar because the dollar will present itself along the way, you know, chase the chase the ability to grow 
and uh, you'll have a great career. So that's that's my big piece of advice. That's phenomenal advice, Aaron. Thank you so much, Aaron. We really, really appreciate it. It's my pleasure. Thank you guys for asking me to do this. I, I'm, I'm honored. Well, we can't thank Aaron enough for jumping on a call with us to talk about this. Uh, before we end today's episode, I'm sitting down with our producer here in the, in the Falcon studio, Jason Ambler, to kind of debrief a little bit on, on what an incredible conversation we just had with Aaron and uh, to kind of set up a little bit the, the next conversation on animation we'll be having in next month's episode. Jason, how's it going? It's going great. Uh, happy to be here. Um, you know, it's great to hear from Aaron. He's got a tremendous amount of experience and unique perspective yeah. on on animation and and his story i was really thankful that he was able to share that and touch on you know some of the keys to success that he's found and have been driving him in his creative path it's such an incredible resume too. yeah the amazing work that he's done and, and the amazing people that he's worked with he was talking a little bit about that as well so uh, we will be catching up with Jason and some other members of our media team and our animation team for uh, our next episode on animation. For now, though, we want to once again thank Aaron for joining us on today's episode, and we want to thank all of you for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, or ideas for future episodes, you can always send us an email at podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. Again, that is podcast at falconscreativegroup.com. Uh, we'll see you in the next episode. This has been Experience Imagination. For more information about this episode's discussion, be sure to visit our blog at falconscreativegroup.com. And don't forget to follow Falcons Creative Group on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.